We're recording now. Okay. Awesome. Hey, everyone. This is the Northampton Police Review Commission, specifically the subcommittee on spending budgets and contracts. This meeting is being recorded and you can find it on Northampton's uh, website, also on the uh, Northampton Open Media YouTube page um, or like the archives page. Both of them typically have this kind of stuff. Um, if you we're going to start with uh, roll call, if I uh, know if you want to count us off. Yeah, Josie. Here. Michael. Here. Dan. Here. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, so today on our agenda, we have roll call. We have the approval of minutes. Do we have any minutes to approve? I always just throw it on there. We had two. Oh, great. So uh, for the dates of, do you know, do you know, the Noah? Date of, yes. Give me one second. I'll pull up my little Excel here. Uh, for the dates of uh, February 3rd and February 17th. Okay. Um, awesome. I said them not today, like a date before. I remember reading for sure the, the, the 17th one. Um, I probably read the other one as well. I would move to approve both uh, both sets of minutes. And second. Awesome. Do you want to okay. count us off, Noah? <laughs> yes. Uh, Josie? Yes. Michael? Yes. And Dan? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Uh, so next we have public comment for 30 minutes. Uh, I just want to run something by the two of you. You know, we usually have 30 minutes. Sometimes we don't always use it. Sometimes people come in a little bit late and raise their hands. If they come in a little bit late and it's not in the like interrupting our line of thought, do you want to hear them out? Do you not want to hear them out? I kind of feel bad sometimes because our minutes are almost never utilized uh, all the way through. But uh, I just want to kind of put that out there to y'all. What do you think? I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm yeah. okay with that. I think, yeah, we, we should hear from as many people as possible. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, but we're going to start a uh, public comment if anyone wants to participate and raise their hand and speak for uh, three minutes. Otherwise, we will get the show on the road. No, you're good? Okay, great. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. So we'll just move on to the next uh, agenda. Just got, just got 29 minutes and 55 seconds back in your life. <laughs> nice. Um, so we, there's a couple of things that I put on the agenda today. Um, things that we kind of talked at, about at the end of the last meeting, things like um, specifics on like contracts on overtime and salaries, like the potential for like hiring freezes, raise freezes, those kinds of things, uh, potential contract bargaining chips, um, such as positioning, how does that work, what can we like maybe negotiate for the next round of uh, negotiations with the police union, um, long term investments. Um, we had turned, we had talked about some stuff and of course, just like your typical things that would, were sent to us. Uh, we got a lot of things recently, um, whether it be like if the Ithaca report or, um, David Hoos, is it Hoos? I don't, I, yeah, yeah. David Hoos sent us something recently today about, I'm trying to remember, I glanced at it. It was Boston, the Boston doing, uh, moving detail work to civilians. And it's like, that's something that we've discussed. And I think, that, you know, it'd be worth discussing here as well. Um, you know, I feel I, I made them separate bullet points, but I really do feel like because it all kind of deals with contracts and the potential of like what um, the police do, we can kind of just kind of piecemeal it however we want. But do you have, do y'all have anything you want to say about it? Anything you're thinking about in terms of, you know, bargaining chips or like responsibilities in the contracts and negotiations and stuff? Well, the, the one thing I would mention about uh, like a hiring freeze uh, type of thing was that that was something that was discussed in the city council, um, you know, at the time of, uh, you know, talking about a reduction in the budget, um, you know, there was some discussion about if it would put the police department in a position where they would, you know, there might be a hiring freeze. That wasn't the route that, you know, the route ultimately was to, to lay off officers um, and keep employed, you know, uh, the most senior officers. Um, but that was that was discussed. And, you know, I, in terms of um, what our uh, role in that is going to be in, in terms of recommendations, uh, I think that that's, you know, that's one of those things like, Dan, you were talking last night about that you kind of, you're envisioning this being like a multi-year process. 
Uh, so hiring freeze, you know, you know, certainly seems like, um, you know, a way to accomplish that without having to lay anybody off. If you just said, okay, over time, we're going to transfer, we want to talk about transferring this money uh, and so forth that, you know, you might, you might even be able to, to modify those numbers some around knowing when certain officers are going to, um, you know, qualify for retirement. I don't, I don't know exactly how to, how to put that. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think especially with, I mean, the, the ultimate issue is that it's going to come down to, you know, the, the city making managerial decisions. Um, and so I include the chief in, in that as part of the city and the police union, which is going to, you know, be upset about any of those things. And so there's, there's so many different ways that it could shake out and there's so many different processes in play. Um, you know, in terms of what they what they forego, how they forego it, um, if they if they choose to, um, I mean, there's there's so many different ways you could do furloughs um, and things, which the department already sort of has built in, right? Like, they're they're sort of staffed for, you know, the chief said seven to eight people, but their minimum is five, um, you know, so staggered staggered furloughs, everybody gets an extra day off. Um, things like that. And you could use that to preserve full-time work. They could do impact bargaining um, and forego hire, not even necessarily like, um, like a hiring freeze, but just a, like a, a wage freeze um, for, for, you know, the patrol officers or for the admin, right? There's 14 um, officers who are the, the lieutenants, the sergeants. Um, and so they get to choose that. Uh, I think what we could do is, um, I mean, we can say <clears throat> that we would recommend, I think it's sort of hard um, to put it out without knowing what the recommendations are, but that I think our best bet is to still recommend, like, I think the strongest argument is to tie costs uh, or, or tie funding to responsibilities and as those tr transition and transfer. Um, and if you have a phased approach, you can you can tell, you know, the, the chief uh, to say, here's X amount of work that you're no longer doing. It's going to result in X percent budget shift for your department and give them plenty of time to prepare. Um, I mean, a bunch of, or not a bunch. Some of the officers have already, um, some officers have already resigned or taken early retirement. Um, that's up to them if, you know, that's what they want to keep doing. Um, but I think that also speaks to the urgency of having a new department start soon so that they can also respond to that. Um, because, you know, if, if officers are leaving, that does put our community and there's no one else to do those tasks, uh, that puts us at a disadvantage. And so we want to make sure that all of those responsibilities are being filled. Um, that being said, um, you know, the, the police have been down, they've lost positions before looking through some of the other budgets, you know, they specifically cite like, oh, we're going to be, we're reducing our, our police budget. Um, I think even in 2014, like there was a special section in the introduction to the budget that said, oh, we're going to, we're going to be losing police, or we're going to lose police officers, and it's going to make us more vulnerable. Um, but Thankfully, it did not lead to widespread anarchy or anything of the sort. So I think there's also a little bit of a buffer. Not that I want to say everyone, like police officers should be overworked um, to do their jobs, but I think there's a little bit of a personnel buffer. Um, and at least that's what it seems like um, that we can that we can reasonably um, accept before the new department is up to. But I think the biggest thing is to make sure that everyone has a chance to um, that everyone has the chance to fully make a decision of what they're doing. So I would still say a phased approach and as much lead time as possible to the departments. Um, but that being said, there are also some things in there. So I think it's 20, oh, like 10 years of budgets in my brain. Um, I think it was 2014, it could have been 2016. At some point, there was the change to replacing three vehicles a year and it was increased to four vehicles a year. Right. The paragraph that includes that is pretty limited. It doesn't really say anything other than we need to do this, 
but they could also go back to three vehicles a year. And that's at least a person um, looking at the cost per vehicle. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, the vehicles they're buying are $75,000 and the starting wage, I think is, what was it? 49,000. So you do, you do cover some people with yeah. two cars being three people basically. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it I think thinking about like giving them options, I mean, we, we can't tell, <laughs> we can't tell the mayor or the chief how to do what they want to do in terms of allocation of resources. But, you know, if that's something you want to highlight as, you know, we recommend going back to what you were doing before for some of these things to defer the, the costs. Well, and some of that, uh, one of the, I went through all those, I went from from 08 to 2020, basically, which is everything where we could just basically see the numbers. You, you, I, there wasn't detail provided for all of that, but in the in the 2010 budget that was provided, you could see the numbers from eight and nine. Uh, so I kind of plugged them all in. And then I was looking at that number, right? I mean, so you go from in 2013, 100,000, $107,000 allocated to vehicles to 2018, $315,000 allocated to vehicles. And part of the narrative and I, I didn't take enough detailed notes on it, I was really focused on the numbers, um, was that the capital improvement plan was paying for some of this. And then the police department was paying for some out of their city allocation as well. So it seems to me that maybe, and, and this is something that I'm only guessing here, so I don't, I shouldn't maybe even guess, but, you know, Mayor Narkowitz is really focused on fiscal stability and, um, you know, kind of accounting for everything you know, in its own department. So it strikes me that maybe he's been the one, I mean, it's all coming out of the city's tax collection. So, you know, if you if you say you're paying for it out of capital improvement, or you're paying for it out of the police department budget, either way, it's coming out of the tax dollars. So, it, it, but it struck me that maybe Mayor Narkowitz had moved these things in there because it looks like it's only happened since he's been the mayor that the, that, 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 that specific OOM line, which is what pays for the cars has increased so much. Uh, but I wondered about that. That's a question that I have for him uh, about that is, um, you know, was it a, what sort of conscious decision was it uh, to make that number grow so much and, and, you know, did the capital improvement plan not, you know, pay for anything after that? Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a really good question. And I, when I was looking through, I wasn't, I was like sort of focusing on like some of those, like, paragraph descriptions about like what are you doing like why do you need more or what's going to happen if you don't get more um like in those budgets and the ten, i tend not to see <laughs> i mean at least you know looking at like years where the police budget was cut it doesn't seem like they were doing any less like they were still arresting the same number of people roughly um given the the, the call volume that they had they were still doing a lot of the sort of program like programmatic work that they were doing before um i i, I don't really see a, a change either way and one thing that's i mean sort of interesting is that i mean it it's not always exactly the same but it's like a roughly four percent increase ish sometimes a little low a lower sometimes a little higher um but for the most part there's no major it seems like it's justification afterwards. Like it's like you're gonna get about about four percent increase and then justify getting that money. It doesn't seem like it's the other way around, or if it or if it is, it's a really convenient <laughs> pattern. Um, and there are the the points where that's not the case, right? So like, um, you know, 2000 and 2016, I think it was 14, one of the years where there was a budget cut of like three hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, and the the mayor singled that out. Um, and things like that. So, yeah, it's you know, it, the increases and decreases seem pretty stable. And again, I don't see them being tracked to specific metrics. Um, in two thousand and seventeen, maybe, or the two thousand and eighteen budget, there's one of them that says that because of the budget cuts previously, they couldn't have a strategic plan, which is interesting because the chief said that they were working on that later and that COVID was the reason they couldn't have a strategic plan. Um, but like looking at, again, like some of those, like some of the justifications and some of the, what you lose, um, I don't necessarily know how closely those are tied to what we might expect. 
Yeah. I mean, just, I just want to finish up on the cars because one of the things that I noted was, you know, you had mentioned uh, Dan about the increase in the budget, the way the budget had grown between 2010 and 2020. So I was kind of focused on that and noticing that between 13 and 18 was when the greatest uh, those five years were, were 60, almost 64% of the increase of that 10. So it, it really took on two thirds of the increase almost in those, in those five years. But even the increase in the cars is only $200,000 out of a $1.85 million increase. So, you know, the, it, the cars, as much as they, as it's a big chunk of money to look at and think, well, we're just going to spend $350,000 on five cars uh, in the grand scheme of things compared to to the other two line items, it's it's just not that not that much, and and you know, and I mentioned before, and I'll just say it again that when we were talking about the cars in June with the police chief, and you know, the kind of comment was made: this is twenty percent of the vehicles get replaced every year. Well, what if it was thirteen percent? You know, could we survive if it was three instead of five? Um, and then ultimately, all five were cut this year anyway. So I, I think we've, we're going to have to figure out between now and July first what's acceptable for a replacement rate. Uh, you know. We'll, we'll see the mayor's presentation first. Right. And the thing about a replacement rate thing is that if we are in our, in our recommendation going to suggest that those services, like traffic services, be moved somewhere else, then those cars see even less wear and tear than they would normally, right? And so that whole, the whole metric for calculating that needs to be looked at all over again. Um, going back to the, the, the metrics used to like justify budget cuts or not justify budget cuts, what you lose and what you don't lose, um, I think like, I think the lack of like really substantive, substantial metrics for why they do what they do is kind of indicative of the way that policing has just kind of been allowed to run unchecked. Um, and um, what is what's the word I'm looking for? My brain's completely fried. Um, unaccountable for so, for, for so many years. Um, and you're right, like you haven't seen um, substantive like crime increases. And even though the cars are only a small portion of the budget, um, like we were saying, that money could be reallocated. I think it's all good. I'm just talking in circles now, I'm realizing. No, you may need cars. If you, if you move traffic to another division, you're gonna need cars for that you know, department rather, you know, for them to effectively move around the city to respond to things. Yeah, you know? I mean, that's true, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the thing, the one of the things that's a little difficult and it's that the police budget itself is so, I mean, it's not by any means the most vague, right? But there are, there are things in there that are a little confusing and there's not necessarily an operating breakdown like for the education. So if you look at the education items, cause I was sort of thinking like, all right, how do we, like, how do we understand this in context? And education is the biggest expenditure in Northampton, it's also, it has a lot more than, you know, 60 employees. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it is a little bit apples and oranges in terms of, of that, but just to look at some of the, some of the ways that information is presented, but the school, like the school budget goes down to like, you know, they account for like oil and gas heating. They account for like all of these different things, you know, in much finer detail, which makes it a lot easier to say, oh, that's how much you're spending. Um, the police have things like miscellaneous, <laughs> um, you know, and it's like what, what goes in, where are the office supplies and what do you need for those? Like, and that's, I mean, it's a silly question when it's like, how much do you need for pencils? But it's also a real question of like, how much do you need <laughs> um, in order to do what you're doing? Um, and I know pencils is a silly, thing so i mean expand that out but like um, you know leasing leasing copiers is gonna be like 20 grand right like like it, they're expensive <laughs> and don't typically buy them maybe the police did i don't know uh it's not a line item so i don't know um for that and so like those type of things like where there's not that granularity i think we're gonna have to rely on the city and you know, the city and the, the department to sort of make those informed decisions about what they, what they have to do. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I don't know if this falls under the scope of, of our subcommittee or the larger subcommittee. I think, I think it could fall under ours, but in, in terms of what we recommend, we are going to be recommending that like the police do a little bit more tracking, like bookkeeping on 
on these sorts of things, right? Because I feel like one of the biggest hurdles that we've had here in this particular subcommittee is trying to find that information, right? And having to comb and like really ask super specifically because it hasn't been as transparent as maybe we'd like it. Yeah, I, you know, I would, I don't want to get too far off topic, um, but just in terms of talking about budgeting specifically and how a budget is, is prepared and presented, you know, the, the superintendent here in Northampton, I mean, he, he writes multiple versions of his budget and presents them to the school committee. He goes over it with the, with the principals in the schools, um, you know, various, and, and uh, uh, also I think with the teachers union gets, gets a, a, you know, a look at it early. So he kind of takes a lot of information in. So Dan, that, that detail that you're talking about, I mean, I really admire that, the kind of transparency of the process that he has with the people that are most affected by it, uh, but also um, the fact that he, he's willing to take feedback on it so early, and, and this is something that I have um, noted that count, city councilors before me, uh, you know, I'm on my first term, but city councilors before me have have always have said that that they would love to see a greater transparency in the process for the city because it's not just the police budget, Dan, that you mentioned. You know, this is a little vague, and but every everything that's you know, the school school department is one half of the budget and the, the rest of the city is basically the other half. That's so you have a, a school committee running half and a city council running the other half, um, approving, I should say, the budgeting on, the, on those two sides. And that process could be much easier to understand, but also to get, to get information and buy-in from so many people. And um, I think also understanding, uh, I mean, some of it is is going to be pretty hard right the the other part of like the police budget itself is that the largest portion of the the largest portion of the budget is uh personnel right by by no stretch of the imagination is it is it not um because it's like personnel is you know five and a half million dollars um in that you know in in the budget and so thinking about what does you know what are the what are the things that the the city might want to renegotiate things like um you know, the um like the career incentives what are they offering what what are we required to to pay because the city bought into the quinn bill again asking you know what happens if you leave that i don't necessarily think that's the best approach um in some ways um, but I mean, you know, one question to ask, so the chief says they lost, lost 10 employees, um, in total. And that includes the people that were training and, and left, um, and includes the people that retired. Um, so there's, I don't know if it's exactly like, you know, anyway, I don't know. I don't have any information or anything, uh, any knowledge about who's left and who's not and why they've left or not. Um, but, um, you know, just thinking about saying, okay, so you've lost those, you know, if we institute a hiring freeze and you're capped at, you know, she said just this month about 33 officers um, that are active duty that are not on parental leave or injured. Um, what does that do? overall, right? That brings us back to, you know, roughly a, a decade ago in terms of the number of police officers. Is that, is that necessarily a bad thing? Is that something that, you know, I mean, again, this is all stuff that they're going to have to continue, they're going to have to sort of contend with, um, but that might be a way to sort of alleviate at least the initial round of what could be, you know, reinvestment and the growing pains that come with that. Absolutely. Um, and to that, and to the whole, the personnel being a, a big part of the, of the budget, um, kind of what uh, Yeping has put in the um, chat that um, Burlington has reduced its maximum officers by 30% by enacting um, attrition and retirement over time, which is something that we could also look into, right? We, like you said, um, there are some officers who took early retirement and if we just like, instead of like five, like quote unquote, laying people off, just like keeping them at the numbers that they are, then that like, you, I, I am not articulate today. That kind of procures a sizable portion of the budget, 
that can then be looked at and earmarked for like transferability to whatever it is that we propose, essentially. Yeah, I mean, to, to complicate some of that, like offering early retirement and things, it's going to take a lot of, that takes a lot more than just the city, like, because early retirement, you know, depending on where their pensions are going through, like that body has to be like, yeah, we want that too. And then decide sort of what the frame is. So like, you know, for myself, my, my union is through the state. Uh, our pensions are through the, the NTA. So <laughs> if I wanted, you know, if they were talking about like, ooh, doing like voluntary layoffs and things like that. And if I wanted to participate, you know, it's not that like my employer could could dictate that or offer that. It's It has to come through the state. Um, but, you know, there are other, you know, there are other things like voluntary separation incentives um, and things like that, that the, that the city could do. Again, that means spending more money up front <laughs> um, for, you know, later savings. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that makes it easier to do um, or to, to, to pitch as a solution. So I don't, I'm, I'm hesitant before we even have like a, a really well thought out recommendation to also recommend what the city does to make up these. But I think it, it is good to be thinking about them, right? Um, so there's a number of, of surrounding cities that have reduced their police force by a significant number. Um, they're still relative, they haven't really seen an uptick in crime at all. In fact, in, in some ways it's gone down, um, like the arrests have gone down and things like that. And we've sort of seen that before, <laughs> uh, you know, in New York City when the police uh, did their first like work to rule slash stoppage and they're like, oh, the city's gonna fall apart. And then it turns out the city didn't fall apart. So they stopped doing that because um, it's a bad bargaining chip. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> I mean, the numbers look like they'd be okay. Um, you know, like just in terms of what the police are doing day to day, um, in terms of return of responding to calls, you know, and again, I, I say day to day, but it's like the aggregate over the year. Um, you know, it knock on wood, I'll be the I'll be the eternal optimist that the city won't fall apart if you know we went back to a lower staffing level um, for a short period of time. But then the other part of this is like calculating out like um, sort of like safety personnel and staffing levels. Like we have a position or we're in a position where having, we could still have more people <laughs> who are responding to particular types of crime or particular types of calls. Um, and so that sort of increases the, the safety staff overall. Um, in terms of staffing levels. And so that's just something to think about um, in terms of like what that, like what that sort of thing means. Um, I've made, I'm gonna say I've gone about two thirds of the way through the Ithaca um, actual proposal. Mm -hmm. It is brutal. It's a hundred pages and what feels like a thousand appendices. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like optimistically without having looked at all of the appendices saying that I'm about two thirds of the way through the whole report, um, you know, but I appreciate the way that they're, some of it's a little bit like basically, basically just rebranding policing at first, right? That's the, the biggest part of it. They're saying we don't have a police department, but we have this other new department and it includes if police officers apply to it, it does include an armed basically a police force. They're doing the same sort of things. But it also includes the ability to transition away from that pretty quickly. I mean, because then, then it's just an internal pivot uh, within that department, which is a little bit easier to sort of do. Um, and they have some more control over training and things like that and civilian oversight, because it's not going to have a police chief, it has a civilian director um, and things like that. So, um, thinking about keeping things short <laughs> and not rambling. Um, but like thinking like they have basically created though an, a safety force, right? That includes unarmed response. And that's how, sort of how they're staffing that. And I don't think that we're gonna be able to say, here's your you know two year pivot, completely remove the police department, establish this new one and, you know, and get it staffed fully I think the, the mayor of Ithaca is really optimistic and he's pushing through a huge amount 
um, so more power to him. Uh, I don't think that we have that here. Like, I don't think we have the, I don't think we have the context that would make that happen. Um, but we can still sort of take that model though and say, all right, if we want 2.8 safety people available to the city per 1,000 residents, um, and we aim for that as the, you know, that's that's a great way to have that iterative staffing, you know, uh, Councilor Labarge's comment. So, and, and to, to take this, so a police officer leaves, we hire a social worker. Now that's, I mean, that was Councilor Labarge's comment. I think we, we wanna be a little more defined in terms of who we want to be hired. Um, but to say, fine, we've, you know, if you lose that, that police officer, you still need someone <laughs> to be rehired for safety. And it's gonna be in this new department and have that person, they can staff that time, they can put in that effort. Um, and, you know, because they're not necessarily gonna be out on patrol, that still leaves plenty of room for community engagement in different ways as well, right? Um, because, you know, as everyone sort of noted, like the call volume might sound really high, but it's not, <laughs> You know, it's not 24/7 that you're like an officer is always on, on and you know actively at a, at a scene, right? So, if we have our safety personnel, they can be out doing things, building relationships with the community, staffing like little info tables. I mean, that seemed to be really effective for the COVID response. It seems really effective for a lot of the folks that do like tabling in Pulaski Park. Um, you know, so I think. Or you know maybe it's just staffing, you know some like the like uh, helping to staff like the community resiliency hub or another warming shelter or something like that any of those sort of things, uh, but we keep the numbers. Sorry, this is still really rambly. Keep the numbers uh, and, and the staffing while transitioning positions away, and that also gives us a little bit of room. You know if the police have already lost ten positions. Um, or they've lost officers. I don't think they've lost 10 total active officers um, from, from the department um, that were you know, out patrolling the streets. But um, if, we've, if we've lost the, lost those, we say, all right, cool. So the staffing for this new department, here's, here's a great recommendation just to start. Decide what you're gonna do, but here's a great way to start. And maybe it's you know, more people, you know, maybe the department for, the new department has staffing at night or more staffing at night and can help with some of those later night calls. I mean, we'd have to know what the call volume by time is for some of these. And we have the call logs by hour, but we don't necessarily have a call volume. We have them by shift, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've said this a couple of times, uh, including um, mentioned it uh, when I was on the radio uh, with Bob Flaherty and he said, you know, so if you're talking about different mental health response, what does that mean? You have to get somebody out of bed if there's a call for it. And I said, no, I think it's got to be professionally staffed the same way that our police, fire and ambulance are professionally staffed. You know, if we're going to respond, you have to treat it the exact same way. It has to be, it has to be priority. Yeah. Um, I still have to spend some time talking to Nick, who's actually started 24 um, seven services before about like, you know, how do you sort of do that <laughs> um you know it, it, the, 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 like the logistics of staffing and you know um how do you make sure that you're you're doing the best that you can in terms of covering shifts and things and i think it's going to be a little hard because we don't necessarily have great data on what what the call volume is for these different things um, as they might be triaged so um but yeah i think that's going to be really useful Right to start to start to look at those things and say, okay, we need, you know, uh, you know, we need to have three people available or three vehicles available uh, to to you know on duty all the time. You know, one of the things that happens in 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 our city is all of a sudden a fourth call comes in at the exact same time, and then you're going to wind up with the police responding after you you know or or some either either you're not going to be able to respond or an alternate to what you've created has to respond. And again, like, like so many things, it just tends to fall right onto the police to, to, to do these things. And, you know, that to me is a concern because I, I, if you said, oh, we, we want to take care of traffic, but the traffic right now, like David had mentioned our, uh, 
you know, our parking attendants maybe could also take on some traffic things and you'd create a different sort of, you know, department around that. And I thought, you know, someone said to me, well, they only work till six. And I said, well, yeah, at 601, you know, you can't say we're taking this off of the, the list of duties that the police do. And then, but except at 601, you know, you can't, you can't do that to the, it's not, it's not fair. It's not fair to the police. It's not fair to the community to say, we're going to handle this differently and then not. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of different models. Like Berkeley has their model where they've sort of smushed it in. It's not just like the parking. It's also like their whole thing is like, in top, like the entire transportation set and traffic enforcement gets put in with that. Northampton does not have a multi-million dollar transportation department. Um, but we, you know, thinking about could traffic enforcement also fall under the DPW? Uh, could you combine the DPW and parking services um, and, and sort of expand that role into a transportation public works. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's sort of weird because we're sort of shoehorning in. Um, it could be that you have, you know, just a new department of traffic enforcement, right? Um, but again, thinking about how, how that would work and what, how it would work and like what you would need for it. Um, <sighs> I think we're always going to be in the position, and this, it's the same thing that the police are in, um, the same thing the fire department's in, is that if you had more people, you could always do more, right? Um, and to say, you know, like, well, I mean, everyone, I want everyone to be able to, res to respond to every call, um, but at the same time, it's just like the police now, you know, if if they have too many people on a scene, they send somebody, <laughs> you know, they send somebody to another place or they call for mutual aid. Um, we don't necessarily have a mutual aid um, sort of sister, like a, a, an organization in another city that's that also does the same sort of work as this community is being, being proposed. So that makes it a little difficult, but, um, that's where we might say we want to build relationships with the community responders that already exist. So HRH 413, um, the Wildflower Alliance, talk to them about what they what they do. And maybe that's where you're, you know, it's going to take a little bit of, it's going to take a lot of time to build those relationships up in the way that you want. Not even a little, I'm going to say a lot of time to, to really cement them in place. But that's a way to, you know, reach out for mutual aid. Right, because there are already people using those services, and some of them are emergencies. Um, and so, if they're already doing that, does it make sense, um, you know, to to talk about that as our partner group, so that we can say, well, three people would be good, um, you know, on on call um, for a particular call volume, and you know, if we can't, then we have that as as backup. I don't know, that, does that make sense in terms of? Yep, absolutely it does. I mean, that's that, what- That is in essence mutual aid. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, it's what the police already do. They just do it with another police department. So right. um, I think there is gonna be some, you do get into the, the weeds though of like paying because the police department pays for those things. So maybe the community department would also pay for those things and uh, you know thinking about what relationships and what what contracts would need to be in place um, with those organizations and to even find out if they would I have a feeling that if we gave if we gave the organizations that do this work the leeway that they want and the autonomy that they want to function as they do um, and to make sure that the practices that our department uses are in line with the practices principles of of a lot of these different organizations um, that that we could then sort of get get buy-in and, and get um, partnerships going in that way. Right. Well, even even having the the fact that the Northampton Police Department, with, if they need mutual aid, rely on the state police sometimes gave me um, just the the thing that I don't know if you had the chance to look at the. I sent you a bill that Lindsay Sabadosa has filed, and there's a couple of other. Uh, co-sponsors on there already now. Uh, so she's picked up some support and I don't know what the likelihood is necessarily, but this sounds to me like it would be some sort of state um, 
state funded approach to what we're talking about right this minute. Um, that, I mean, I looked through it, I'll admit I didn't read too deeply because it got, it got That's pretty law-like very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, yes. I'll admit, sometimes it's like reading going, I know this is reference to something else. All right, give me a minute, let me go see. Cause it's like, oh, this is adding like E and F to this other thing. It's like, okay, let's go look. Um, but um, I think one thing that we do have to be a little careful of is that sometimes these things start out and like reading some of it, it seemed, I'm not hundred percent sure if I could tell if it was going to be the arbiter of the grants that go out or if it itself was going to be like funded by, um, so like how, how the funding for this group was going to go. Um, I know there was the applications for grant funding because then they have a committee that decides who gets money and stuff, but like I just being wary of the fact that state funding could disappear and that we'd want to we'd want to be ahead of that and have a department that was as stable as possible before. Yeah. yeah, I look at some of that grant work and I think that's how you, you know, that's how you um get vehicles, that's how you get, you know, it to, to support this department. That's how you create some of the infrastructure around it uh that you're already building in with staffing and everything but that's how you kind of kind of uh i guess support i don't know what the word is i was looking for support um that you know with with that grant work would be you know that that would be interesting yeah uh absolutely um really quickly getting back to your point michael about how, you know, if we do shift these services to things that already exist, we can't just have them like leave at six o'clock, for example, right? Um, which I think is a really, really valid point. Uh, I remember at some point, someone had sent us an article about Denver, Colorado and their mental health response and how they kind of ran a pilot version of it that ran during, you know, your typical business hours. And then of course, like many things have, police and kind of take on the parts of it that that thing hadn't gone to. Uh, but what they saw is that during that time, many people utilize it during those hours. And even the police chief of Denver, I believe, uh, was like, yeah, we're going to we're going to like try to fund this thing so that it can run 24 seven. So it's uh, it, I think it's, a, a, you know, there's a couple as, as Dan has mentioned, there's a couple different approaches that we can take. Um, one of them is definitely, uh, you know, a, a slower rolled out approach where we collect metrics and data, find out how how important it is to have it during you know, nighttime hours versus during the day, uh, late afternoons versus early mornings. And as we see uh, successful metrics expand on those programs, uh, it's just, I think that's just something to consider. Yeah, that's really, um, yeah, that, that's funny, right? I mean, because if you, if you want a coffee, you have to go to Haymarket when it's open. Uh, you know, so if you, if you, you know, if you need these services, you, you know, not, not that you're anybody can necessarily control when they may be having a mental health episode, but when it's available, you know, the understanding of when it's available may lead to, to greater engagement, right? Uh, especially if it's a test. Uh, that's, that's a good point, Joseph. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we should be, I think one of the things we should be aware of, though, and this is something that the chief pointed out already, is that when services aren't available, things do default to the police. But if we're saying that we want, if we're saying we want people to take advantage of this, we have to make sure that it's available for them when it when it's happening. And I think especially with, um, well, I mean, when it comes to like things that are beyond, like traffic enforcement, you know, you're going to have spikes during the morning and the evening, right? because it's rush hour, <laughs> you know, late at night is when you're going to be looking for, you know, impaired operators. Um, but there's, and in some ways you might be able to say, I think there's some, some minor causal links between like time of night and, and certain types of, um, you know, mental health crises and behavior, but it, it, at best I can tell it's a weak causation and I'm not a psychologist either. So, <laughs> um, you know, I don't know, but like, I think it's important to make sure that the services are still available as long as possible. Um, but the other part is that 
and um, you know, we also don't know who's we don't know the entire volume of people who aren't reporting or aren't, aren't reaching out for help um, because people are afraid of the system that exists now, right? So, if, you know, either a loss of housing or getting DCF involved. Um, and this runs the, the sort of board of, you know, mental health, substance use, domestic violence, all of those things create those sort of scenarios. So I think it's also, because one of the things I think came up that came out of Denver is, is that, it wasn't just everyone had better outcomes, which was good, um, but they were getting more people to, to respond um, and to utilize those resources and services that were made available. Or at least they, they had a higher volume than they expected. And so I think that's... Well, let's be, let's be frank. I mean, you, you're gonna do a better job if you have more dots to connect. You know, if you, if you have more opportunity to connect people with services. So if people aren't utilizing the service of the police right now when they when they need help, you know, but you have an opportunity to create a, a way to help them, the community gets better. Yeah. And the support for those things get better too. As, as that? and the support for those things gets better too, as more visibility is shown at the um just how deep um the fear of the current system is and the the non-utilization of the sort of services that exist now are. Yep. Awesome. I think one other one other part that's in this in this vein, um, uh, and it's sort of on the list, I think, is the detail work. Um, so it looks like, you know, Massachusetts has basically, I mean, it allows for civilian flaggers in a lot of cases. Um, the wording of it is that it, it would still be, you know, whatever the city sets as the pay rate for those flaggers. Um, one of the, the complaints is that it costs the same to hire a civilian flagger as it does to hire a police officer flagger. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily all that, like that's the only barrier. I think some of this is also the ease in which you can find and hire those flaggers. So I think one of the things might be, I don't think detail pay is going anywhere. Like detail work isn't gonna go anywhere. I think it's just gonna be about expanding that to all, um, to all people. And then or to you know maybe members of the city, so employees of the city, uh, widely. So de so the detail work can be done by just about anybody. Um, the city would still get its cut of the funds, which I'm pretty sure the city doesn't want to lose. Um, <laughs> you know, as as Michael you pointed out, it's about a million dollars um, a year that the city gets from that. So I think for the recommendation that we would have uh, would be to establish you know, establish a way to, establish a way to support civilian flaggers as, as an option um, to make it widely available. Um, but that also leaves, you know, because David was sort of concerned about that. And I think they were gonna say in the policies and services that they might recommend, or the alternative is just doing away with <laughs> detail work from the police department. I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, you know, but I do think that we can open that up. I mean, that's why that's why the governor, uh, Governor Patrick, all those years ago, opened up um, flagging. So I think putting that in place is going to be really useful. Yeah, and I think a way to to be able to put that sort of system in place is it would be some form of um, almost like a work swap sort of system. Um, I used to work for uh, UMass Transit. And their work swap system, which is coded by the wonderful people over there, basically, like, if something's available, you know, you let you let people know that these things are available ahead of time, obviously. And then people can go in, check it. And if they want to pick it up, they pick it up. And then it's assigned to them with the expectation that they will be there. Uh, almost almost kind of like a gig economy in some weird ways. Uh, but, I mean, I think that's something that you could look into. And there are people who would know how to set up that kind of system who I could get in contact to. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... That's actually what the police do now, basically, is that they list out 
they list out all of the um, all of the the detail options, and then people can bid on them. And then when they get bid on, there's like a there's like a rank order in terms of like who gets preference for what based on what they've already done too. So it's not like everybody gets you know <laughs> everyone gets the best detail or whatever it is. I don't know how those things get decided uh, or like qualitatively, but you know there's there's a process in terms of like setting up um, who's going to be working in those details. And so you could just expand that out. Yeah. Um, the other, the other part of that to note, and this is, this is pretty common across the state actually, is that I think actually beyond the state, but I don't know officially, um, but that's most of the detail work, like not most, but a significant portion of detail work goes unfulfilled. Um, and that's when it opens up. And that's why in the, the detail pay, we have so many of those people that aren't actual Northampton police officers that are in there. And that's why it was really confusing going like, why is that person not on your budgeted list of people? And it's like, oh, it's because they were <laughs> from another city like that Northampton had to reach out and say, nobody wants to do this. So all we're doing is just opening that door to improve some of that service too. Um, and I think just still leaving it, um, I think we could set it as, you know, detail pay is unarmed or detail work is unarmed. Um, you know, especially when it's like guarding parade, like walking down parade routes or doing like traffic enforcement, um, you know, sort of like this, this street is closed while they're working on it. Um, and then, you know, from that point, you know, you have, um, you know, officers could bid on that too, and they just do it as they if they were taking a civilian job and working somewhere else um you know, because at that point those officers are not on duty as police officers anymore they're just on duty as fa as flaggers yep definitely um, no i think i think that's i think that's great and i think that was also in the in the boston report as well that um, a lot of that detail work does go unfulfilled um yeah and, and you know that's where you know in northampton specifically we, we pick up uh state police officers picking up those detail work and also uh people that work for the hampshire county sheriff's department as well uh, i know that there's um you know that's that just is always something that, that i notice if i'm if i see you know, a construction site and you see somebody that's not in a, you know, Northampton police uniform, you notice, you know, like, oh, there's, there's a person that's in the sheriff uh, uniform. So it's just a little different. And we do, you know, engage those people as well. And then other cities can pick it up also. But if they have a shortcoming, <laughs> if they're not filling all of their detail work either, then, you know, I guess it comes down to timing too, when, when people are available and when a detail is needed. So. Right. And, and depending on how how deeply connect, uh, connected uh, the services we uh, propose are, you know, especially with um, regards to the house's population in terms of like, you know, flagging, for example, we then we then put, you know, money into the hands of people who are going to be spending it and, and within the community, you know, and that money kind of propagates like that. Um, and it's up and it's lifting up a you know, a very vulnerable part of our population. And I think uh, really opening this up to be a really uh, bountiful thing for the city of Northampton. Because if some of those um, detail requests do go unfulfilled, that is, again, more revenue for the city uh, in the long term and more revenue in the hands of people who, you know, could really use it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, a very obvious reason that the police union has fought so hard to keep that uh, keep those detailed jobs done by police officers, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely lucrative. Uh, so it's, you know, and, and I agree with you, Josie there, you know, uh, I think this all the time, people that make, make $170,000 a year now making 180,000, you know, there's somebody that makes none that could really use the 10, uh, you know, so I, I, I see what you're saying. I agree with you. Yeah. And I mean, I think the other, the other part of this is going to be, you know, again, you know, if you take traffic enforcement and it becomes its own department somehow, again, I'm not sure how that would, that would work. There's so many different models, but if it does, well, there you've got built in already a great new, op like a new employment opportunity. Um, the same thing if 
like so right now the police department has training incentives for for people like having those same training incentives for employees so they can be trained to do other jobs uh, or advanced jobs so that they can you know you have people you create the opportunities for people to become you know peer responders with lived experience so you're creating the space uh, that encourages that which is not something that not something that's common um and so like i think that's really going to be i think that would require that the city needs to look at how it hires people and that's across the board um i will say i went through a whirlwind tour hiring <laughs> with like hiring and doing interviews with noah um but really being like the experience that i have is much more it's it's different <laughs> and so i think looking at you know how the city you know, reaches out lets people know about employment opportunities and how it hires and staffs um and that could be across the board too it doesn't have to be limited to just what we're suggesting um in terms of a department that handles you know mental health and substance use it could also be um you know for the clerks it could be for <laughs> um it could be for parking enforcement, it could be for maintenance, you know, all of those different things. Yeah, and that's the, the liaison relationship with these with these other agencies may, you know, maybe a good resource for that sort of thing too, in terms of, of advertising uh, for open positions. Yeah. Mm. Great. Just looking at the agenda, trying to see what else we can cover today. Um, we haven't really talked about raise freezes and the potential for that. What, is, what does that look like? Um, is there, so I, I know very little about the way that raises kind of get um, doled out aside from the fact that, you know, you work there long enough, you work a year, it goes up, the number goes up, right? The big number makes you feel good um, kind of thing. But is there a way to do uh, kind of like like a staggered freeze, right? Like where not everyone is frozen, but maybe those at the top or those at the bottom? Or, and what does that look like? Is that is that something that is done usually or maybe not necessarily in Northampton, just in general? Yeah, I mean, yes-ish. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's possible, like anything is possible, right, right, right. <laughs> um, but it requires both the city and the union to really bargain about those things. I um, think, and it's important to note that the city has multiple police unions too. So it's, it's not the same contract that they would be bargaining against. It's two. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that they could do it. Like if you did like cuts or furloughs and things like that, those all happen at the in the at the level of the position, mm -hmm. um, you know. So like you can't just say I want to fire like a specific police officer, and you know look at their line item and say we're going to get rid of that position. Right. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly how the I don't know how the contracts would. I don't think they specify anything. At least nothing is coming to mind, uh, but it that would have to be something that plays out and the union would really have to be the driving force behind that, I think, if it wasn't a blanket freeze across, right. you know, everything. Right. Um, and I mean, they, they could certainly opt for it. I think, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that could, I mean, the police wages have been frozen before um, but those were mostly in regards to budget shortfalls rather than a reinvestment. Um, I mean, well, a budget shortfall is a reinvestment. It's just a harsh one. <laughs> uh, you can't get around, right? Like where you say, yeah. you don't have enough money to do these things. Um, this, I think we're, uh, we're approaching a more conscious reinvestment. And so that might result in different personnel changes in a different function. Mm -hmm. um, and that that would play out differently in terms of what the union what the unions would agree to and make, um, I, think, I think that'll shift what they'd want or willing be willing to do because 
typically it's temporary hiring freezes or temporary, you know, pay freeze. Um, in this case, I don't think there's any guarantee that that would be temporary. And in fact, I think the express pur purpose would be not to be temporary. Um, right. But, you know, there are also other ways to sort of work that. So like in Ithaca, you know, if a, the, so all the police the proposal is basically all the police officers will lose their jobs by 2023. And then they'll have these new positions that have, you know, new, just new job descriptions, new pay scale, new everything, but that they will apply for those positions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you had a scenario where you were doing a new department like this, you know, or let's say there's traffic openings, uh, I guess you're going to staff a new traffic department. In theory, you could have police officers who, you know, might be losing their jobs or might be subject to a budget freeze or furloughs. And they say, I'm just going to apply for this other position. Um, you know, and basically, so, you know, the way we're, the way we've sort of structured this is here's a new place, responsibilities go there, funding goes there. And in theory, you could have personnel that are also dedicated to that particular function and follow that function and funding. Um, I think it'd be important to do the same sort of restaffing that Ithaca is doing where you're, you're making sure that somebody reapplies for that position, knowing fully what that position is um, right. and making sure that they're the best compared to every other applicant, that it's not necessarily preferential um, in there and that they're okay with what that department does too, right? I don't think anything that we are proposing is... Um, like, I don't think it's super radical, but it is different than the policing model that exists for a lot of things, a lot of functions. Not all of them, right? The police department is still gonna exist. Um, the, they're still gonna be responding to their subset of, of responsibilities. So. So this is not something that I think we've discussed at length, either in this subcommittee or in the greater um, general committee, but along the same line, I believe it's Camden, the Camden Police Department in New Jersey. They, and it's for completely different reasons. I want to put that out very clearly. They didn't do it because of like a, a national push or I think it was budgetary, but they did ascend. If I remember correctly, they dissolved their police department as it stood and like, like essentially hit the reset button, had people reapply, like you said, under new positions, under new um, job descriptions and new responsibilities um, without having, uh, if I remember correctly, a deeply adverse effect to the community. Um, I don't think that we've really thought about something like that for us. And I don't know if we've really put enough time to think of, um, you know, the effects of something like that. Or maybe you have, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to put thoughts in your head or not. Yeah, I mean, I so the 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 Camden Police Department it, that that whole thing is is a little bit of a if you look at what they actually did versus what they said they wanted to do, right? <laughs> it's very very different, right? Because yeah. they said, oh, we're gonna you know we have um, you know we have budgetary woes as a as a city, but we also have this department that is extraordinarily abusive, and we're gonna we're going to completely redo everything. We're going to make this new, the, the sheriff's sort of office. And, um, you know, when they did that, it, it was just hiring back. Yeah. Of, and it didn't change the model of policing sub, substantively. Like they, it didn't change the calls or the way that they were responding to calls. It didn't change that meaningfully. And I think that's what we're trying to do where we're just saying, right. right. Like, so, I'm, and again, that, that gets more towards like Ithaca, like what Ithaca is doing almost is like mm -hmm. the Camden example is a much stronger one of that, which is rebranding the same thing. Yeah. Which I don't think we want. I think we want, right, we, don't. we want something where the responsibilities and the functions of the police department are, are limited to what they are uniquely qualified in the system that we have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it just, yeah. At, at the end of this, you know, for it's very likely that, you know, the, yeah, we're, 
I don't think opting for a dissolution of the police department without having something again like Ithaca already established and in place. And I mean, that's been, you know, for them, that's been planned for a while. They had, you know, consultants come in to sort of look and do those deep analyses of what they needed. And um, yeah, I don't think that Northampton is there yet. Um, like, I don't think that we could. I don't think it would go anywhere if we made that recommendation. Right. I guess what I was suggesting was not that recommendation per se, but something that, like you, like you pointed out, is similar in the way that it is rolled out, but for meaningful function changes and a meaningful uh, reallocation of responsibilities and positions. But maybe that's just, maybe you're right. Maybe we're not there yet. Yeah, I mean, I think we sort of have that in this, you know, if there was an officer that was super dedicated to mental health responses, right. um, they could apply, you know, for a job in the new department as a, you know. Why to be the department head? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, yeah. right? I mean. <laughs> that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole point is that, you know, they would just have to be okay with responding as this group is going to respond. So that includes, you know, not having a weapon um, and not having sort of like the, the power of the state behind them in terms of enforcement, it comes at, you know, building relationships and sort of going there, you know, not powerless, but to, to go in there just as, as a peer. Um, and so if they really wanted to, they could do that. Um, and that, that, again, that, that response, the funding for the responsibilities would, would go to that new department. They could take on that role. Uh, if they weren't, you know, they could still be, <laughs> you know, if they, they happen to, they could still be a police officer in Northampton. I don't think anything in the next, in the next, like, certainly not the next couple of months, um, very likely not the next couple of years is going to completely remove the Northampton police department. Um, it, it, you'd have to have, you know, a city council that was on board, a mayor that was on board and a population that's on board. Um, and I think we have, you know, one and a half of those. Uh, yeah, those you <laughs> you know, maybe even two of those things, you know, depending, you know, it's going to be a lot about really conveying the real message, which is that at the end of the day, I don't necessarily care what the group is that does the job. <laughs> I much more care about the job that's being done in the way that it's been the way that it's being done in terms of making sure that everyone has the same equitable access to the same services and to make sure that those services actually provide the results that we want as a community. Those are the two. Yeah. Those are the two things that I care about. Um, you know, when it comes to who does it, as long as the process is being, you know, followed, as long as those expectations are being met, anyone can do those jobs, right? Like anyone can, can yes. perform the task. It's just a question of, you know, do they want to in that setting? Absolutely. No, I'm there with you. So I think we're, we're basically taking the slower approach <laughs> to get the same result, which is building up and reinvesting in all the things that haven't been invested in for right. a very long time. Um, so taking the funds, making sure that that happens and that that investment there, the commitments there, and it's gonna be hard. You know, the city doesn't right. have unlimited resources, um, you know, but also in some ways you can get a lot more, uh, sorry, bang for the buck, I suppose, <laughs> with some of these other, these other institutions because of how they function as well, so. But to get back to the original question, though, um, budget freezes and or hiring freezes and um, yeah, the any of those things that's going to be that's going to be a negotiation between the city and the the unions. That like they'll allow for it, and there's so many different forms that they could take. And if the union had a proposal that said, uh, "Hey, everybody." Uh, all the, all the sergeants and the captain and the chief are going to take a pay cut and everybody else just does a pay freeze and then nobody loses anything. You could do that. They could decide that. Um, that's, as a union, they could 
they could all go, they could all vote, they can, whatever consensus model they have. Um, and, and they could do it. The city could even recommend that they do it or at least consider it, but like, they're not in a position to tell the union how to handle that in some ways, so. Right. Right. <clears throat> right, if you said to the union, here's, here's five, here's a $4 million personnel budget, how do you wanna spend it? Yeah. basically yeah and i mean that's i mean that's sort of what <laughs> organizations uh do which is why we have unions so that it's not all on yeah. one um yeah the only other part that comes to this is also and this does sort of depend on what the city is expecting to get in general <laughs> uh in terms of, of money from the state and everything else like all of those sort of expected revenues and carry over and interest and and all of the 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 all the revenue you know is going to affect what the city has for expenditures too so you know i, I can't necessarily say at this like other departments might also experience you know budget cuts and and shortfalls and things like that. I think the key is that if there's a cut to the police that we make sure that as much as possible is reinvested into the community. Um, because this isn't, we don't want it to be just about a budget shortfall in one year um, or however long it takes to recover <laughs> um, from that. So I think that's, you know, that could be an important part of the recommendation. Something that we include is that you know, if there's a cut um, from emergency response services, we could also say if the fire department is being cut, <laughs> like, hey, reinvest those as much as you can, reinvest that back into community services. Well, I mean, the fire department handles, you know, the ambulances housed there as well, and they, and that, they respond to, to plenty of, of the calls that we're talking about too. Yeah. Absolutely. And that was, yeah, and that, and, that sort of gets at the Ithaca model, right? Where they're just, they're lumping all of the responses that the city has to those health oriented um, and emergency oriented things um, all into the same sort of house. So fire, EMS, police, um, you know, sort of unarmed civilian responders, all of that is all in the same, it's all in the same category. Northampton's a little bit trickier because there's all the different little smaller pots um, that it goes into, but I think we can just, I think for us to reiterate our commitment that the city invest in, invest in the community and the response and, you know, care for that community in all different forms. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> On, this, on the same kind of uh, idea of compensation for personnel, uh, something we hadn't considered or have, well, we have, we've talked about it, but like uh, overtime, you know, I know that there, there is like a, there's like a cap to overtime, right? No, like no person for a single, not for police at all. I mean, the, when we asked about it, the chief didn't mention anything about caps. Um, they have rules for how overtime gets applied. And she said that she looks to make sure that she doesn't think anyone is overworking. So to, for me, from my perspective, right, what overlook, overwork looks like is different for the job. And for a job that's as intense as policing, I figured you'd hit that burnout point a lot sooner. Uh, I know that while driving buses, like we weren't legally allowed to uh, drive any more than like 10 hours in a given day. Uh, we could do other jobs that would get us slightly more overtime, I think at a max of 12 or 14, but it could not be all driving for the, for reasons such as burnout. And, you know, you are, you have other people's lives as a responsibility with them, um, with public transportation in the same way that you do policing. Um, and even if it's, even if it's a, a desk job, I mean, like people, people need to rest um, just in general, um, which then ties into the detail work, right? If you're doing the, the policing and the overtime and the detail, that stuff stacks uh, on a job that's already incredibly stressful. Yeah, so um, just so that the, 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 the chief's actual quote, um, 
you know, when we asked about um, how folks are like how, how you determine staffing levels and, and all of that sort of stuff um, in those, we watch overtime numbers. Um, the majority of patrol overtime is caused by vacant patrol shifts that if unfilled would drop, drop us under the patrol minimum of five officers, even though that, that five is sort of right. That, that is what it is. Um, if we're going to be under the minimum and overtime shift is posted, we should not routinely be using overtime to fill minimum staffing levels. Um, this results in overworked and overtired officers. When our overtime budget is at or beyond its funded level, we know we are pushing our patrol staff to their limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that's the, um, that's the limit there. And I think that's, it's not necessarily bad. I think it's empathetic to the chief trying to fulfill a policy that she created. Um, but at the same time, I agree. Like I've, I've done, you know, 60, 70, 80 hour weeks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <Wow>. And <laughs> some of them multiple, multiple weeks in a row. And I know how terrible it feels and also like what my decision-making capacities and also my colleagues, um, you know, going like, oh, we're all, we're all struggling to think of that same one word and no one in this meeting can think of it because we've all been going at this. And that's, that's low pressure, right? Like, <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's a low pressure scenario. It's not high pressure where you're making those sort of instant decisions where it gets sort of frightening. Mm -hmm. um, so I think even if we just had language that, you know, um, language that we want to make sure that no one is being overworked at that point and that there are limits. Um, and that also that overtime and detail pay hour limits might be important to have. Um, so that you don't have someone doing 80 hours of, of detail work uh, or sorry, work and detail work routinely. Um, you know, it just, it doesn't create a safe place or a safe scenario um, right. for anyone involved. We want everyone to be at the top, the top, the top of their game. Yeah. Especially with a, with a job as important as policing. there's there's plenty of data <laughs> you know <laughs> if we if we if you really wanted to dig into what is it you know how do we know that people's judgment gets impaired after working too much there's tons of studies on that that you can grab um but i think we all understand that like it's not a it's not a crazy claim if you work 80 hours a week a bunch of weeks you're gonna be tired yeah and I think I think I think the population recognizes policing as an extremely stressful job, um, and you know I th I think you hit that wall a lot sooner. I would even say like forty hours of just straight policing is a lot. I know that the even my regular weeks at, at driving bus, just driving forty hours a week is a ton. Um, and you know even if it's not all super intensive, sometimes even the monotony of it, like really gets to you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think I think language that pushes a recommendation of like, you know, monitoring detail over time in order to avoid those situations. Those uh with the added um support of you know, that five personnel model with some of it potentially going to peer-to-peer -peer work, I think would limit the amount of um, patrol overtime, I guess, is a way to look at it, perhaps. Um, so we know that we're not pushing um, those officers to the brink. Yeah. The, the other part of that, and it, it could be something that, you know, this looked at for multiple departments, especially the one that we're recommending, but also for the police department is just tying in, like, you know, establishing the measurable objectives that you want your department to meet, but also to make sure that increases in funding are tied to meeting, you know, meaningful measurable objectives. And I say that also for the department that we're proposing that yeah. you know, as that grows, that they have those meaningful metrics. And as long as they're meeting those, um, but that we also include language somewhere that we recommend language that says 
um, that we also don't want people to be in the same position that police officers are in where they're working 80 hours a week. <laughs> right. um, because, you know, the same thing applies, even though they're not walking into a situation with weapons, you still don't want someone walking into, you know, a high stress situation, you know, being like, wow, I wish I could have gotten like, you know, another two hours of sleep. Um, Absolutely. Or just being sort of, you know, sort of, let's say soul weary, right? Like a lot of this work is draining. Yeah. Um, Loki, a lot of work in general is draining. <laughs> a mood for 2020 <laughs> and 2021. It's truly, truly. <laughs> a thumbs up in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, I think the establishment of like, and, and really looking to tie, I guess, budget changes to specific things and, and those specific changes to outcomes. Because that's, that's something that I don't really see a lot of in the current police budgets um, or in a lot of budgets in general, like just looking over the city budget itself, um, that the changes aren't necessarily tied to things other than, you know, well, we usually give everyone a, everyone gets a 2% raise or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's been a, a big, I don't know if it gets articulated as well as maybe it should be, but I think that's been a huge kind of sticking point in this commission as a whole is that it's not about making the community less safe. It's actually trying to reinvest in the community, make it stronger, make sure that more people are utilizing these services, um, make sure people can be held accountable, things are transparent, um, you know, really trying to quantify the metrics in which we want to, to judge Northampton, um, make sure that it's being successful for the people who live here and for the people who visit um, and overall steer the city in a better direction. I think that's something that we, we like, I personally believe it's been front and center for the commission the whole time. But sometimes, you know, sometimes we get lost in the, the details. And sometimes, depending on the language or the wording we use, people get confused. I get confused sometimes. I was confused yesterday. <laughs> um, but yeah. Well, and I think, you know, Josie, to your point, um, you know, you're, what you're talking about is investing in our most vulnerable people, right? I mean, we're, we're, you're not talking about making the community less safe. You know, we're talking about making the community more safe, but, but specifically, you know, funding some support for our most vulnerable. And that's, yeah. you know, I think ultimately that's, that's where the win comes for me is when, when you're thinking about this and, and how do you, how do you really want to care for the community? Well, you know, you have to start with the people that need the most care. Absolutely. The other, Go ahead. No, I was just going to say the other thing that um so thinking about the structure of like mobile response units and, and things like Toronto is suggesting is that, the, and Rachel even mentioned this, is that it does open it up to sort of a like multiple municipality, you know, relationship. So if we have this department, other department, other cities, you know, if they want to buy in, you know, and maybe it's that they contribute a position's worth of funding um, or, or other, you know, whatever those relationships are that we establish, but that way you can expand that because a lot of the problem, it's not like the problems, like some of the things that happen in Northampton suddenly don't happen. It doesn't suddenly stop after you cross a border um, for a city. And so moving, I think moving in that direction where we can expand some of those services and get them also to other, to other areas that might not have the funds to start up and maintain a department of their own. Um, but that we start to expand that so that it becomes a support. Um, you know, Northampton already has a lot of, it, it acts as sort of a hub for a lot of communities um, in a lot of different ways. And this is just sort of expanding that. Yeah. Um, well, it's the county seat, um, you know, and, you know, even very specifically, I think I mentioned before that Northampton is part of a cooperative effort um, around contact tracing, but but more specifically, when you look at, at the, the budget for veteran services. Um, our veteran services department isn't really referred to as the Northampton veteran services, it's Hampshire County. And we serve 10 other communities uh, as part of that. And I'm not 100% clear on what, what the rest of them kick into that uh, funding. But at the same time, I know that 
that when you look at that veteran services, there's there's a lot of other communities that are drawing off of what Northampton provides there. So this isn't a foreign concept that, that you've just mentioned. Yeah, Dan, I, w- I really want to thank you for articulating that point, because that's kind of what I've been trying to get to what I've been talking about, why I believe Northampton is one of the most well-suited um, communities to pick up this kind of work. If we establish that central hub, if we establish these webs of mutual aid, of, of, of uh, community building, we then not only serve as an example for our neighboring communities to then pre- uh, produce buy-in, um, but this network could expand. And if it expands, it becomes more efficient. Uh, it reaches more people and uh, there's overall greater equity. And um, you know, what's that saying? Like a rising tide raises all ships kind of thing, right? Like we're the county seat and this is the exactly the kind of work that uh, you know this county and just Massachusetts in general could really benefit from. Yeah, and I mean it sort of brings us up to you know you use this Carol used the the switchboard operator um, but one of the things that I do think we need to also think about is establishing space in dispatch training so that they have the budget to actually go and have these like so once, once these departments are established we still need to do training both on what the departments do how to triage what the flow chart might look like <laughs> you know and I'm, I'm imagining a fairly complex decision tree as they work with people to figure out what what goes where um, you know so that if you know an armed robbery is not going to get a pure response right, right. <laughs> like that, that's just not how that's going to happen um in the way that we've talked about this department so far um but you know making sure that you know if someone you know um was you know if there was suspected substance use or you know even if it was some of the things that they have where it's just like oh someone's someone's asleep um you know, and, but, but triaging it so that, you know, it, it makes sense like, oh, this person is, you know, someone calls says, hey, there's someone who's sort of just asleep in, the, in Pulaski Park. You, you don't have an armed officer sort of waking them up. You just have, you know, a person. I mean, they can still have a, a Lord blanket. Yeah, but, you know, like, but to, to check on them, say, hey, you okay? Oh, you're sleeping outside. It's, you know, Maybe it's not the summer where it's nice and warm and an afternoon nap. Maybe it's, you know, oh, do you want to know about some resources for, you know, or here's a warming center that has beds that, you know, you can go use or whatever it is. Um, But to have that, to make sure that the dispatch is trained in that, but also trained to be able to, so then you know, not only what the new department does and where those responsibilities lie in relation to the police department, fire department, EMTs, everybody else. Um, so they need to know that network, but they also need to know sort of how to talk to people <laughs> to get the information that they need. Um, and I'm not saying that they're not trained now. Um, the chief thinks they do a great job. Um, they probably do. <laughs> um, but I think that, that we wanna make sure that they have the, the necessary training that they feel they need to. Um, so that they can do that work. Like what are the skill, what are the specific skills they need to attain? Um, but also that, that does take money, right, <laughs> um, to do. Yeah, right now it's a, a 12 person department uh, to the tune of uh, about, about $700,000. Uh, that's, that's PS and OM only. Obviously there's no, there's no uh, other than ordinary maintenance. Um, yeah, and I know they went through like a little bit of a reorganization, restructuring too, fairly recently, not super long ago. Um, yeah, but again, I think it's going to be, you know, there's there's going to have to be sort of the internal training, but then also some external training. Um, and you know, for a department again, it's only twelve people. It probably won't be that large, but also <laughs> it's not zero. And if they're operating on a pretty bare bones budget. We want to make sure that they, they still get the funding that they need. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this brings a question to my mind, which is um, 
as a group here, um, I think this discussion has been really, really great today. Again, I mean, I really enjoy meeting with you guys, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, really, I feel like I, I'm learning from you every week. But I, I also wonder, should, should we think about as a group, maybe meeting with alternatives in a, in a co subcommittee meeting uh, to start to really apply some of this stuff that's been on my mind for a few days. And we are tomorrow, 21 days away from the final report. <laughs> no pressure. <Yeah. laughs> I, I just have to ask, do you ever, did you play like Zelda where you just get that like two days remaining, 24 hours? Oh. Remaining? Wow. That, Majora's Mask, yeah. Yes, it's just that, it's just your face on the screen now, 24 hours remain. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, I think that makes sense. Um, I've been trying to listen in Same. You know, on, on what they do and sort of sit through those meetings. Um, no be there tonight after we end this one. Yeah. Um, but I think having like a collaborative, like a moment to just say like, what are you thinking? And then here we go. And the same thing for policies, you know, and services, that's where we sort of come in to say like, what are you recommending? Um, or, you know, what are, what are the strongest points? What does it take to accomplish those? Um, Cause that's going to be a, you know, we're, we're, I think, the most reactive. I think we've been the most proactive in requesting information. But I think we'll, at the I think end, need it to be. <laughs> I think we'll also be the most reactive in terms of like, we can't, we can't do much until, <laughs> until they start. Like we, we've investigated, we've got some ideas, we've got some, you know, in general inklings, we know the contracts, uh, we know where they are, we know the sort of managerial oversight we know the <laughs> the budget's pretty well um, slowly getting more familiar with them than like my own partner. <laughs> Feels like just oh. spending all day, but um, I hadn't thought about that, but that's true for me as well. Because we're we're distant, we've been distant for a year and a half now because of schooling. But like, yeah, it's so bad. Just like, all right, here's another another night with a budget. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, no, it takes, it takes time to sort of parse out what those, what those are, what they mean, what was happening, get the context from that year as well. So you have to like read the descriptions that the mayor puts forth and like the, the justifications that they have for increases, decreases, changes, reorganization notes um, to also pull some of that sort of institutional history knowledge. Or it's just like what was happening in the city in 2012 that made things look like this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, my one question about uh, a joint subcommittee meeting, which I'm all for, by the way, is how close can we dance before it becomes against open meeting uh, in terms of like the general commission, right? Uh, I, I do definitely see the roads where alternatives and spending and contracts intersect. I absolutely do. But at what point does that become like the whole commission? I know we've talked about chairs meeting together, which I'm again also for. Uh, Don't think, because a, a quorum for our commission would be what? It's a uh, seven. People. Is it seven? There's thirteen people. I thought we have fourteen people. Don't we have fourteen? No, I think thirteen. Okay, I could be wrong. I I can count. You can count Noah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't counted in a while. <laughs> but again. But I mean, basically, we just have to make sure that we're not meeting quorum in that meeting for commissioners that are participating. So we would, unfortunately, yeah. Well, if there's. Could there be a non speaking party? Well, there's also um, in. What is it? The. Alternatives has Booker, um, Carol, right? Booker, Carol, and Alex, Javier, and Alex. Okay, yeah, so we would hit that. All right. Um, yeah. We just add people really quick just to sit in. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't break quorum. <laughs> quorum has been 
the the bane of my existence. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> the number of times I've wanted to reach out to someone on the commission, just be like, I need to pick your brain on something so that I can like understand, right? It's just like I don't know if I can, because what if they go talk to someone else and then you get sent to the chain and it's just like something I don't want to deal with, um, which is why I'm bringing it up now. Um, but would would it fun like? So at that point, we would. Or if long- someone's just there listening or um could we have like a non-speaking party could like someone one or two people sit out i don't think that there's a i don't think there's like an option for like a person that sits out like i don't think that's a thing because they're still present so so okay so like when we go and visit other subcommittee units to watch them live does that run the risk of potentially breaking quorum no, I don't think so because you're not participating. You're not, right. del- you're not deliberating with that group. So that's what I'm saying. Could we have someone who just doesn't participate? And I'm putting, putting your quotes, but I actually mean like don't participate. I mean, I don't know, because that's when you're pulling in the the, the, the two bodies, right? Mm-hmm. It's a good question. Because we're at quorum when there's two of us, because our subcommittee is so small. Yeah. And so you could still, in theory, have our committee show up with two people representing our subcommittee, but not breaking quorum because that'd be two and four, right? I'm not saying that one of us sit out, but I am saying, like, isn't that how it would work? Yeah, if, we, if there was someone who didn't participate in that meeting, like they weren't part of it at all, mm-hmm. at all, at all, then... Yes, I think the other way to get around that is to task. If we gave the task of meeting to discuss alternatives and spending <laughs> to seven people and it created a new subcommittee oh boy. that would meet for that specific task, uh, I think that would be the way to do it. But I also don't know what happens if a can you have a subcommittee that meets quorum for the general commission? I don't think so. I think I think it'd have to be six. Yeah. I think we I think that was part of what they said at the beginning is that we couldn't have a subcommittee that was more than half of the commission. Which is I think why we ultimately broke it up into three three pieces. If I if I my memory serves me right from months ago. Yeah, I don't I don't remember that, but it could have been. How easy is it to get in contact with the city solicitor? Because I haven't tried once. It is just an email away. It's super easy. He's really he's really responsive too, actually. That's awesome. Maybe we should ask. Because I, I, I definitely think the sooner that we get into a joint yeah. um, subcommission, maybe the, the more we can put uh, like mortar to brick, right? Is that, is that what is that what you use to brick houses? I don't actually know. Is it, <laughs> <laughs> is it mortar? I don't know. Yeah. Which, which subcommittee is Cynthia on? Uh, Cynthia's on the policies and services. So this policies and services has six then? Because they have Chris now? Uh, I'm just trying to count the numbers. One, two, three, four. Does anybody know whose email is EBRN? Is Elizabeth? E- Elizabeth. E- yeah, Elizabeth. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. That's close. <laughs> so Nick, Namdi, Cynthia, David, Elizabeth. Yeah. So is actually Chris on alternatives then? So that makes alternatives has five. No, Chris is and... on community outreach. Okay. So he's not on one of the other three though. <laughs> the original three. Okay. Right. So that's okay. Now I got it. Um, real quick, because we are about to run into time and I do know that Noah needs to move on into something else. If we just really want to quickly schedule just a time so that if the other group want to schedule time, we've got our slot good to go. Yeah, I would say, why don't we do the same Wednesday? Does that work for people? So I said that last week and I forgot that I do GSA in the afternoon for my students on Wednesdays which is why I was squeaking in today. And I was burned out at the beginning and a little bit more revved up by the end. Uh, though we hate Fridays, could we do a Friday? 
or a Monday. I could do a Monday, but I'd have to get that um, scheduled to know as quickly as possible, which is fine. Yeah, um, yeah, if you get it to me tomorrow morning. I mean, the other option, again, because we're talking about meeting with the alternatives, is waiting. Uh, we could do a little bit, what, like, would later on a Wednesday work? But yeah, later on a Wednesday, yeah, I, I don't know why I didn't consider that. Later on a Wednesday would work. I just, okay. like, I didn't get the chance to decompress with this meeting, and I really needed to. Just, I mean, I'm just thinking, like, they meet on 7.30 to 9.30, so maybe we could talk to them if we're not stealing Noah away from right. <laughs> their meeting and double booking them. It makes it makes sense that maybe maybe they could do a little earlier. We start a little later, and that way we've got either we've got meetings where you know we're sort of running our own, or we're just overlapping completely the entire time or whatever they want to do. We could also um, cut our meeting short a little bit too, in order to prevent as much overlap as possible. Yeah. An, um, hour, an hour and a half perhaps what day are we talking yeah. about uh <laughs> wednesday the third wednesday the third. okay let me see and you know they might also not want to spend the whole meeting <laughs> or they might want to spend like schedule a different meeting just because they're doing you know all of their stuff as well so they might not have time in their space we might need to just schedule something else out entirely I also, yeah, um, Booker hasn't confirmed that Wednesday yet, so. Yeah, I would imagine they won't have it until uh, after tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I okay. you know what? I don't want to be burdened. I can just do, I can just do five thirty. It's fine. Five thirty on Wednesday. Yeah, five thirty. I can do five thirty. Seven thirty. It's fine. So I was saying maybe be tentative about that so that. You know, if the alternatives is going to do next Wednesday too, we can just plan our meeting to meet with them and that's our time. Sure. Uh, in case I don't make it for the whole meeting though, do you mind just letting me know what they end up planning at the, um, in an email at the end of tonight's meeting? So uh, I know how soon I got to send something to you. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. It's uh, definitely next Wednesday though. That's fine. That's great. And do we set a time for next Saturday? We have an, a uh, time. 11 a.m. It is 11? Okay, yeah. That's yeah. what I thought, but I wasn't 100% sure. You'll get an email from me, uh, hopefully either tomorrow afternoon or early Friday morning, with like a link to the community survey to send out to all of the ward constituents and also, you know, the our, our sort of, our document for um what that what that march 6th uh public hearing will be mm -hmm. as right. well so there's hopefully something that helps guide a little bit of that uh, i'm meeting with cynthia uh tomorrow so we can um yeah hash that out a bit. yeah uh i think for our next meeting we should um you may maybe start compiling um the framework for what our on our final. So actually, Dan, as, as, as you know, chair of the, the larger committee, did you see, uh, you saw a more collaborative uh, final report rather than the piecemeal progress report we gave, right? Yeah. Do we still want to commit some time in these subcommittee meetings to hammer out some co-writing time uh, for some of the larger, some of the things that we have more principled responsibility for? you think it'd be worth it or, or do we want to commit like larger chunks of joint time with the other commissioners? I would say probably joint time. Like okay. I think the goal for the, the goal for the overall report um, in that, and it's in that outline um, sort of is that sort of want to bake the, the why and the what and the why together. Yeah. So that, you know, here's our recommendation for a new community department and here's what that department is going to do and here's why they're going to do it. Um, the, the budgetary part is just sort of the recommendations of the sort of that what and how. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's a, you know, as, as we, we sort of knew going in um, into this, it's not as though 
like the Northampton police are like the they're not like the New York police in terms of like a wildly out of control um you know spending granted there are some things that are concerning um but you know I don't think that we have a lot to say individually I think it would be hard to have like a spending part um other than to you know as part of like the current so there's that section of like what the like a description of the NPD you know we can we can contribute to that um to say this is how much they spend this is what the the work that they do here's the time that they spend according to their logs um you know here are their policies on certain things um no but that most of what we do is sort of interspersed in there i don't know if that makes sense um i, th I think it does yeah yeah no absolutely um that being said do we want our next meeting then to be um kind of like a creation of things that we can bring up in the larger joint writing commission not not necessarily writing the points per se but really hammering on like the vision the budgetary vision of what it'll look like i think that's a great idea yeah and to i mean we can we can highlight points of you know sort of opportunities challenges yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely and i think it's great yeah uh just kind of general talking points that that i that really should be addressed in the larger commission with everyone there especially as we um, kind of mend those those joint subcommittee meetings potentially, and as we you know as as uh, Michael's pointed out, we hit that twenty one day, you know we're almost there. So yeah, yeah. really yeah. bring in the things that we want to make sure make it into the commission into the larger report. I think is uh, something that'd be worth our time. Awesome. Well, it's seven twenty one. Well, motion to adjourn. A uh, second. Awesome. Uh, since Noah is not here, I will count us off. Uh, I don't want to discuss it. I'm not sure if any of you want to discuss it, but uh, Dan? Uh, yes. Michael? Yes. And Josie? Yes. We are adjourned. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Oh, good night. Thank it was great you. talking to y'all. Always a pleasure. Thanks very much. Yeah. See you soon. See you soon. <laughs>